Thank you for coming out. Um, my name is Richo. Uh, I work for a payments company called Stripe. I do kind of security things there. Um, you may have seen me from such ridiculous things as a friend and I hacked a skateboard and then made him give us a CVE for it. So now we have the only CVE in the world for a skateboard. Um, you can find me at these places on the internet. Uh, I kind of like want to start by disclaiming a little bit. So I, this, I've never been to Strange Loop before. In fact, I've never spoken at an event geared kind of towards developers before. I've only ever spoken about kind of security research things. Um, and I didn't have a whole bunch of an idea about like what to expect from like strange loop or what to expect or what I should like be trying to give out of a talk. And I really got the feeling that like the bulk of especially good strange loop talks are basically interpretive dance with like some computers on the fringe, uh, which unfortunately I'm not going to be able to live up to today. Uh, I'm honestly just like not feeling super well. Uh, and so I kind of went through all of the bits that I was going to do code and like just made a lot of screenshots so I can point to them and like not be trying to do two things at once, uh, which I'm hoping will kind of like and with this going a little, little bit better, but so I'm gonna like preemptively apologize for the lack of like cartwheels and shit while I like build computers, um, which brings me to the other note that I have in my notes, which is that I'm really Australian and I swear a lot, and I'm sorry if that's gonna annoy you. Uh, I will try to keep it to a minimum. Uh, so anyway, like why actually give this talk? Um, like I think Rust is pretty neat uh, as a security person who really likes exploiting memory corruption bugs. Like, I'm vaguely concerned Rust is going to put me out of business, but I feel kind of confident that it won't. Uh, compilers are also neat just because, like, working at this, like, bizarre, like, several layers of abstraction it is just, like, something I find really fascinating. Uh, the, like, the, the satisfaction that you get when, like, a, a huge number of moving pieces all come together and you, like, set PC to the start of your code and, like, jump into it and, like, good things happen. Uh, is really exciting, which is kind of why I first got started tinkering with compilers. And when I started fiddling with Rust a couple of years ago, I got really excited about some of its properties. Uh, and yeah, hopefully there'll be some overlap between those two things, or this is going to be a shitty talk. So how, I, I guess, like, the, the most obvious thing to do is like write a compiler in as little code as humanly possible. Uh, and this is it. Um, so if you take this and you compile it with a Rust compiler, the object it emits will be a Rust compiler. Um, and so I considered just like dropping the mic and leaving it at that, but that'd be kind of dull. Uh, but like the, the machinations that make this possible, I actually think are like incredibly interesting. Uh, and the reason for this is because uh, Rust's object model, like the, the discrete packages in which it stores its code, uh, contain all of the metadata associated with them. And so like, for example, if, if you're compiling C code with Clang or GCC, there is nothing apart from the actual code for GCC or Clang that you can like include into your code that will just like give you a C compiler to play with at your program's runtime, uh, and that that gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility in as far as like your code can reach into the internals of Rust and then like fiddle with it, and you can do this really really transparently as long as you don't mind kind of a, a fairly Rust's user land stability guarantees are quite a thing. Uh, Rust's compiler internal stability guarantees don't actually exist. Uh, so you're kind of going to be stuck on a version for a while. And to do this, you need to uh, include this feature gate, which means you have to be on a nightly. Uh, anyway. Uh, and so one of the reasons that your resulting object is so small uh, is because all of the Rust compiler is just a dynamic library that's uh, distributed with the compiler um, to you, the end user. And so I had a like vague what even is a compiler slide um, because I figured it was worth setting some tone. But basically, like the the uh, dictionary defines it as a computer program that translates ba basically something that translates from one thing into another thing, which is why I think the transpiler movement is weird and kooky. Like that thing is also just called a compiler. Um, but like this isn't super helpful, especially. <laughs> uh, but like, you know, even once you have a, a grasp on like what a compiler is, you start to think like, well, why do I want one? Um, for the vast majority of things, uh, giggles or curiosity, I think, is probably the correct answer. Um, if you're actually settling down to write a compiler, I strongly suspect that what you want is a compiler that already exists and like to modify it. Um, but there are some like really some actually in, like incredibly interesting cases where it totally is the right solution. And my, friend, my favorite one is Varnish. Has anyone here used Varnish? Uh, yeah, cool, a few people. It, it's like PHK's uh, like pet project from years ago. He calls it a web application accelerator. It's a proxy. Uh, 
But so it has this domain specific language called VCL, which compiles to C code with a bunch of like interesting guarantees. One of them being that everything that VCL offers you runs in constant time, which turns out to be a really important constraint when you're like potentially going to shove like millions of requests a second through this thing. Uh, and so like in spite of my disdain, like there totally are coherent times when you should think like I'm a build a compiler, I'm going to stick it in production. But so to answer the question on the last slide, like this is fundamentally what a compiler is. Uh, you like take some input, you pass it into some intermediate representation, you pass that through something that knows how to generate code, probably assemble that into an object, and then you execute it. Great. Except it's not like, really that simple. It winds up looking closer to this in the real world, uh, which just has a couple of extra steps. Um, so, so the basic notion here is that like the red boxes are things that you have and can look at and kind of exist on the file system, and the blue boxes are uh, properties of the compiler. They're, they're parts of the computer program that knows how to compile your code. Uh, and so realistically, you take your input, you lex it into an array of tokens, you pass those tokens into an AST, you code gen that into some assembly code, you assemble that into objects, you link a bunch of objects together, you get an executable. Too easy. Or not. Uh, so I guess like put uh, ma made more concrete, th this is kind of like what that pipeline winds up looking like. Um, so this is like a really trivial piece of C code. Uh, if you're paying attention, you will realize that this C code can be optimized away to a single jump instruction, which would also be a really, really dull talk. Uh, but so we, we lex uh, the input string into this like array of tokens. Then the parser takes the array of tokens and turns it into an abstract syntax tree. Uh, this isn't any particular representation. This was like a data structure I cooked up while I was writing this talk. Uh, statistically, there's probably something that uses this exact format, but I have no idea what it is. Uh, so then once you have your AST, you do code gen on it, uh, and you get native code, or at least something that you can translate literally into native code. This is where my, my grand plan of like showing it visually started to fall apart a little bit. Uh, so then you turn it into assembly, and like you, it's the same thing, except I couldn't work out how to make O-Tool use Intel syntax. So it's at and uh, And then finally, you link it together into an executable. And I was like, I, I kind of, I Googled Mac O object, hoping that something really funny would come up. And I could use that as my last one, but it didn't. So instead, it's an executable. Uh, and then in the spirit of like talking about how things work in the real world, it actually turns out that like this is what your compiler looks like, in that once you have the AST, like long before you generate code from it, you want to like do some stuff, right? Like in the case of Rust, the borrow checker is going to throw an error and make you hate yourself and Rust. But like, in the more general case, like you might do some type checking. Uh, so you like verify that all the places that you're calling functions actually accept like those arguments. Uh, you might do visibility checking, where you're checking that no one's poking at APIs they're not supposed to be able to prod at. You might do, you know, kind of like coherence checking, which is broadly what the uh, like the borrow checker in Rust comes down to. And then like you almost certainly want to do some optimization even before you get to uh, code generation. Uh, and unfortunately, like then you, you realize that in order to like really do coherence testing, you also need to involve the linker, and like this pipeline doesn't make sense, and everything is talking to everything else, and it's that picture where it says like, why is Redis talking to MongoDB? Uh, and like, oh god, help. So I originally was planning to kind of try and like smash through all of this in 40 minutes. And I realized that that was untenable and also like just not going to be very interesting because I was going to wind up doing a lot of like very, very aggressive hand waving in place of like explaining things. Uh, so instead, what I figured I'd do was I would implement a really, really naive and shitty uh, compiler in Rust, and then I would aggressively hand wave about all the cool ways that we could use Rust machinery to make it better because when I ran this talk, I also didn't have time for all of that. So off the bat, we're going to build a brainfuck compiler. Partially so I can justify swearing a lot more in this talk, and also because BrainFuck is neat and maps very, very well onto von Neumann machines. Uh, so basically, if you've not seen BrainFuck Brain before, it has eight instructions. Uh, and so you can imagine the, the BrainFuck machine as being a gigantic tape made up of cells uh, with a read head that sits on the tape. Uh, and so the instructions let you increment the current cell, decrement the current cell, move the cell pointer around. Uh, it has uh, a loop construction, which is how it's provably Turing complete in that when you see the left bracket, you jump to the right one unless you're zero. Oh, sorry. You jump to the right one if you're zero. Uh, and then uh, two instructions for interacting with the outside world, because it turns out not being able to do I.O. kind of sucks. Uh, and so this is like the really small, I, yeah, I sort of feel bad about bailing on the live coding, but I'm also kind of OK with it. Um, 
Th this was like the naive interpreter that I knocked up. Uh, and so basically, like, I I'm going to walk through this in a little detail because I think it's probably going to become important later. Uh, but like at a really high level, this basically just uh, takes a file, reads a bunch of tokens out of it, pushes them into this data structure that we're calling program, and returns it. And so this is just kind of like rusty setting things up. Uh, I realized after I made the screenshot that program is a type alias. It's just a vector of opcode. Uh, unfortunately, I, I decided not to change my slides at the last second. Um, we create this macro for uh, pushing, which is one of the things that's like honestly really amazing when you start trying to tackle a problem like this in Rust, uh, is being able to abstract your problems away with like layers and layers and layers of macro magic. Uh, as long as you're the only person who's going to read or write this code, fabulous. Uh, and so basically what this does is if there is nothing currently in the loop stack, then just like push the current instruction onto the current program. If you do have like an open loop, uh, basically, like if there are some open left braces, uh, then what we want to do is shove this instruction into that left brace so that we wind up with this like kind of nested stack structure of uh, program opcodes, of which some are more loops. Uh, and again, this is kind of made possible by Rust having uh, like some types that let us be very, very expressive about the, in, like, the intent of the code, which in this case is to describe instructions that a virtual machine could execute uh, by encoding it into the type system. And so the parser is really, really simple because parsing stuff where there are only single character tokens and they're all context free is really, really straightforward. So basically, we just go through and like shove a bunch of stuff into, like, basically, shove all of the instructions into this vector of vectors. And then uh, checking the loop stack is empty is just like the one coherence check that we get out of a brainfuck compiler, which is asserting that we have the same number of left and right brackets. And then we shove it back out. And so when, you know, that's great. We have this data structure full of instructions, but like it's kind of useless if we can't execute them. So I built this stinky little uh, interpreter, and it's really sort of, it's pretty straightforward. There's like this, like, unwrap, um, it's my favorite. Uh, they, they took away the read u8 function between me writing this code and this talk. Uh, but basically, all this does is iterate over the program. Uh, in the case where it finds a loop, it uh, recursively evaluates the loop. Uh, and then kind of like does exactly what you think. It evaluates spring code. Hooray! But so we're meant to be talking about compilers, so let's generate some native code instead. So we can kind of like take the operation of this code and turn it directly into assembly really, really trivially. Uh, this was my dumb implementation, um, which is just targeting like an x86 machine. Uh, and, and this is just like byte for byte re-implementation of exactly the same functionality. When you add, you like increment a func uh, when, when you move, you like shift the tape pointer. When you add or subtract, you add, uh, you, you poke at the value pointed to by the tape pointer. Um, I.O. is pretty straightforward as well, as long as you don't mind hard coding a bunch of syscall numbers. Um, yeah, I, it's not even important if you like read native code. Uh, take my word for it. This thing writes a byte to stand it out at the, at the value pointed to by ESI. Uh, and then finally, for loops, we like actually had to do some real work, right? Like up until now, there was basically like a single instruction that did whatever it was we we're interested in doing, which was pretty straightforward to code gen. So what I did in the spirit of doing like the, the naivest thing I could think of was I went through and I tagged every single instruction with a label, uh, and then at that label, I would then, if I saw a jump, I would uh, unconditionally jump to the other label and. Uh, at the other end, I would check whether or not the value is 0, and if not, jump back. And this was purely to protect myself from a dumb off by one error that I made a bunch of times that caused it to loop indefinitely. But so basically, we can do some trivial optimization for this, right? Like at code generation time, we can go through and say, like, hey, you have 160 add instructions in a row. Why don't I turn that into like the two operand form of add that accepts like an argument and turn it into like one instruction instead of 160? Um, which would be neat. But that would also be sort of like ignoring this whole like Rust scene user land thing that I'm going for. Oh, there is some boilerplate associated with it as well. Uh, this again is like sort of not interesting, but I was very diligent in like copy pasting all the stuff that I was planning to talk about while I was live coding. Um, I mean, if you're curious, basically uh, there's a BSS section at the start of an object, uh, which instead of being packed with data, uh, is an instruction to the loader saying like, hey, reserve me some space when you map this thing into memory. Um, so we like create this gigantic area there called tape, which is just like 30,000 bytes. Uh, 
uh, there's a dot function which knows how to write a single byte. Uh, and then our start symbol basically says, like, hey, like, before we jump into the program. Uh, and like, this works. Um, so this is what happens if you run it. Uh, I was on a hack trip with some of my coworkers a couple of years ago in La Jolla, and somehow someone nerd sniped Nelhaj into writing a queen in BrainFuck for some reason, uh, which the whole time I've been working on BrainFuck compilers, I've been using his as the default test case because it has like a lot of less nested loops. I'm like, why the hell not? So like, neat. Uh, this works, kind of. Uh, it, it relies on like a lot of ridiculous assumptions, uh, one of them being that your language is context-free and pretty straightforward to parse, uh, another being that you're uh, running on x86, that the syscall numbers happen to be the same, uh, and additionally, it's extremely difficult to reason about. If, if you started like expanding the instruction set of BrainFuck um, and, and started involving like instructions that take operands or more state or more than one tape or syscalls or basically anything, uh, you would very, very soon find yourself really miserable because you'd built this like unstructured mess of spaghetti. So like, what if we wanted to expand this into like a less shitty compiler? Uh, the, the first obvious step would be fixing code gen. Uh, and I wanted to like go on a little bit of an adventure uh, to talk about like the current state of compilers, why and how they work the way they do, and like what we can learn from that. Uh, and so like GCC is architecturally monolithic in that RMS went out of his way to make it as humanly possible, uh, as humanly difficult as possible to interact with its implementation because he was concerned that someone would build a proprietary backend for it. Uh, that kind of sucks. Uh, but even so, like in spite of the fact that GCC's code is very tethered together, GCC still has a bunch of discrete steps. And it turns out that when you invoke GCC on the command line, it's actually just shelling out to a bunch of its subtools after like trying to infer what it is that you really want it to do. Uh, and so like CC1 is the compiler. There is a program called CPP, which doesn't have anything to do with C++, which instead preprocesses. Uh, LD is the linker and so forth. Uh, and so then Clang came along onto the scene in the last five years or so, I guess. Um, which Clang is basically just a GCC replacement. There, there was a lot of hubbub as like various large-ish projects kind of on the order of an operating system managed to migrate their way across to using Clang instead of GCC. Uh, but interestingly, it has a very modular architecture, which is neat if you like want to poke at the internals of a compiler. And it backs onto LLVM. Uh, and so LLVM is the low-level virtual machine. Uh, it, it abstracts away your physical machine in the way that uh, before I was writing out uh, native instructions for x86. And so if you're like me and you're one of the only people in the universe who still cares about PowerPC, for example, and you wanted to build this code on PowerPC, you would have to do one of like a few things. You can like special case it and like use the config flags and Rust to like pull in the PowerPC module that knows how to structure it. You can like do a bunch of stuff, but it's going to be fairly miserable. So instead, the approach that LLVM takes is that you write uh, this intermediate representation, uh, which is basically platform agnostic. They're, I say basically because unfortunately like implementation details like always creep in, but like for the most part you can write like pure code in IR and have it like build for any target. Uh, and then LVM both has a lot of infrastructure for dealing with this, this internal representation as well as, uh, sorry, intermediate representation, as well as for subsequently writing it out into native objects that target the platform that it is that like you care about. Uh, and kind of as a bonus, um, the example I showed before, and I forgot to mention, still hinged on a lot of external tools. That, the code that I showed off was only capable of emitting the assembly code, uh, kind of like as ASCII text. So you're still dependent on an assembler and a linker and you know, various other tools to turn it into uh, native code. So like IR is neat, because if we write out IR, then like now we can have LLVM do like a bunch of grunt work for us. Uh, it also does things like optimize and registerize for us, which is just like busy work, basically. Uh, but so there's an aside. Uh, when I submitted this talk, I was like really acutely aware of the fact that I was submitting a talk that depends on implementation details of a language that's like made it their mission to change as humanly quickly, po change as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, and so, like, probably 12 weeks ago, there started to be like noises on on the IRC about like Rust growing a new intermediate format um, to replace kind of like the internals of trans that it has right now, which are functional but kind of annoying. Uh, and so I was watching this and I was like, I might not get away with this. 
Uh, and it landed like a couple of days ago, I'm assuming out of spite. Uh, and so, so while it is awesome that Rust has this new intermediate format, and it would have been even awesomer if I had had the time in the last couple of weeks to learn how it worked so I could target that, uh, unfortunately, I sort of just didn't. Um, so this talk currently just assumes that you're using Rust 1.4. I don't really think that's a problem, because if you copy paste anything out of this talk and then try to put it in production, you've made a terrible mistake anyway. But you should probably be aware that if, like, when I'll push all the code afterwards, when you try to build it, you will need a snapshot of Rust 1.4. Um, and this kind of speaks to the, the compatibility guarantees that Rust gives you in that, like, if it's user land code, like, if it's in lib stable, they will go so far out of their way to avoid breaking your code. Uh, but they have a fairly similar design contract to LLVM internally, which is that, like, the internal should be good code, it should make sense, it should be well documented, but if you feel like just, actually, sorry, that was one of the other things I meant to mention earlier. How many people here have like written code that uses strings in Rust? I'm sorry. So I broke that once. Um, it, it's like the biggest PR that I ever got into Rust, which also broke GitHub, was the, the rename from str to string, um, which, yeah, the whole universe caught fire. Uh, which, which I guess is kind of like the, the mechanism that they've now exposed to compiler internals, which is that like you can break pretty much whatever you want. You just have to fix all the call sites as well. Uh, which, which I'm like I've taken as the like try not to wreck yourself principle. Um, but so we're like building things now that we're kind of done with our history lesson. Uh, you know, earlier I pulled apart my like tiny Rust C binary and saw what it was linked against and kind of at least very strongly insinuated there was probably some cool stuff in there that we could use. Uh, and like the most obvious one is Rust C LVM. Uh, and so I'm going to avoid doing the whole like scroll through a mountain of code thing because it's a little unclear to me that it's actually helpful. But so Rust C LVM is basically a high level wrapper or a medium level wrapper on top of LLVM. Uh, and so what it gives you is access to not the whole LLVM API because it Turns out that there is a direct linear relationship between like stuff that the Rust developers have wanted at some point and whether or not it has bindings. Uh, but like given the maturity of the Rust compiler at this point, that's kind of a lot of stuff. Uh, and using this, we can do native code gen. We can have LLVM involve the assembler, uh, invoke the assembler and the linker for us, um, which will like save us a whole bunch of time. We can target other machines very trivially. The only thing we have to cough up to LLVM is a target triple. Um, and so it winds up looking a little something like this. Um, so this is just kind of like the top to give you some idea of why I didn't want to scroll through a bunch of boilerplate code, because there is a lot of it. Uh, and at some point, I basically want to refactor this talk into kind of like some neat helpers for toy compilers on top of this. But basically, you can go through and one for one translate the calls that we're making, uh, the, the native code that we're assembling before into calls into LLVM, which uh, you basically get this builder interface, and then you call like uh, like build fadd, for example, to say I want to add two numbers together. And this gets hairy pretty fast, but it's like strictly less hairy than like temp you know basically like string templating your assembly together. So we'll take that as a win. Um, there is a ton about LLVM already on the web, which is also why I'm kind of tempted to talk more about like Rust specific things and like how to drive LLVM. Uh, but so you basically have two choices at about this point. Uh, you can either drive LLVM directly, uh, or you can try and drive Rust internals directly. And having tried the second one and written a blog post about it, I'm like just not even going to suggest you try it. The unfortunate reality is that the LLVM bindings use basically a series of opaque types, which Rust doesn't use directly internally. Like its internal representation in trans, unfortunately, doesn't use any of them. And so you have to pick your poison up front. I'm pretty confident that just using LLVM and like using the bindings and building your own abstraction on top of it is like almost certainly the path to glory. That said, uh, there is another module called Rusty Driver, um, and Rusty Driver is exactly what it sounds like. It's the module I poked at the start to like uh, kind of stunt hack myself a cheap compiler. Uh, and so, if you just open, it, like, if you're okay with the hideous compile times of building Rust over and over again, and you just want a dumb prototype, like. Just going shopping inside of Rusty Driver is like the totally tenable option C. But so, all right, we're going to use LLVM. We get a free optimizer. We get like an external linkage story for free. Like all of a sudden, we can refer to external symbols and like have good things happen. Uh, we can interrupt with other LLVM tools. Uh, archiving is sort of a solved problem. It turns out that archivers still basically suck. Uh, 
And we get like symbols and like a debugging story. Neat. So like what else can we fix about our dumb compiler? Well, so I mean brainfuck is sort of dull, right? Like at the end of the day, if we're writing brainfuck, we're almost entirely just writing machine instructions for a really shitty, small, limited CPU. Uh, and so we can build out a language that's a strict subset of Rust <clears throat> and uh, turn it back into our existing code gem machinery. And in this way, we can kind of like incrementally build ourselves a new platform on which to build code. So like this is uh, ba basically the machinery that you need to parse a Rust file. Uh, and Nick Cameron gave a really fantastic talk at, uh, at RustCamp this year about like building your own static analysis tools. But basically what this does is take the code on the right and turn it into the code on the left, which is a little daunting. Um, and, and so like given that you're, you're interested in uh, like taking your AST and generating some native code from it, uh, like it turns out the Rust pattern matching capabilities are basically the exact thing that you want. Uh, and so for example, like th this is uh, the chunk of code that um, in, in my like Dumb language that I implemented for this, uh, the only thing that you're allowed to do is define top level functions. It has no notion of globals. It has no notion of shared scope. The only thing you can do is define functions with local variables in them that accept arguments. Um, and so we're basically saying, like, I want to take uh, every item in the crate, which is kind of the, the high level, uh, like, level of, level of abstraction in Rust, in that a translation unit is one crate. And I want to iterate over the nodes in the top level module. And every time I get an item, uh, sorry, an item is uh, the high level unit of abstraction for like a thing. So like a config directive is an item, a global variable is an item, a function is an item. Every time I get an item that is a function, I want to unpack it, pass it through a bunch of my analysis passes, uh, which indirectly do roughly the same thing as far as they just patent match like a champ over it to try and extract uh, the local variables, the statements, the arguments, and the return type. And then I shove that into my context. Uh, and what I'm left with is a context that I can hand into CodeGen to turn this into a native object. Uh, and so this is kind of what that winds up looking like as far as like extracting the statements. And right with drift is a very real problem that you're going to run into. Um, but so uh, again, it basically does exactly the same thing. Uh, at one point, I was going to make declarations work, and then I decided that my language is cheaper and easier without them. Um, so basically, I'm taking the set of uh, semicolon terminated uh, expressions, uh, looking through and trying to find out whether or not they're an assignment or a call or a function call, which is the only two operations that my, BM, that my language supports, uh, and then handing it into more parses. Uh, and conveniently, this does mean that you, like, if you want to have locally defined functions, for example, you kind of get that for free. Like, you, you can just like call into yourself. Uh, and so, like, Rust density here turns out to be really, really interesting purely because like the the right would drift is hugely significant uh, you, you will spend a lot of time like furiously unpacking objects uh, but one of the things that's fascinating about rust is that its error messages are so good that like while you're on this like wild mission to like pattern match your way to glory uh, rust is actually extremely good about saying like hey like have you tried unpacking this other thing let me tell you some more stuff about it uh, which makes the like Com compile fail to like working compiler uh, iteration cycle really really quick, and so like this is kind of what that winds up doing. Uh, I like handed in a file. Uh, it inferred that I had a local variable c. Uh, it takes a couple of arguments. Uh, it has an expression which is adding the bound variables a and b together, and my main function just like calls into uh, my foo.rs. So I'm actually running really ahead of time. Uh, I'm also really not feeling super well. So I'm going to wrap this up early, I'm afraid, and I'm kind of sorry. Uh, but uh, Rust gives you a bunch of cool toys to play with. Uh, the, the sheer amount of stuff that it gives you that you can kind of like grab and pull apart and fiddle with uh, at, at compile time is, is really significant. Uh, and the, the number of times that I went down something that was, it, it became fairly evident that it wasn't going to work quite early on. Uh, but it was still like, Honestly, kind of satisfying to, to extend it all the way through to failure was kind of like an interesting and new experience for me, having tried this done in C++ before. Uh, and Rust's error messaging is fantastic as far as like, it turns out that with git grep and like, uh, I, I use Vim, so using the like make inside of Vim and git grep with 
a single buffer in the Rust source, you can kind of jump around, I, I think, in many ways quicker than if you're using Racer. So I did want to kind of try and nerd snipe you into building some cool shit, because I want to play with it. Um, so one of the things that's really bothered me that kind of like inspired me to talk about this in the first place was uh, why do compilers always target native code? Um, so I, I used to maintain this project called underscore VM that is sort of a debacle. It, uh, underscore VM is itself uh, a, a rubby DSL. Um, and basically what it lets you do is I used to work on the RVM project and I got frustrated by how un unmaintainable it was. So I wrote a rubby DSL that emits Ruby code. Uh, and so, I'm oh, sorry, that emits uh, valid POSIX shell code that like, manages versions, but it does things like uh, constantification so it doesn't leak any state into your shell. It's kind of a disaster. Uh, but so, like, re-implementing um, re -implementing something like that as like, a native language that backs onto POSIX shell uh, is something that I'm like, really surprised that no one ha has really explored before. I kind of assumed that this would be a, a, a real thing. Um, there's also definitely, like, Lib syntax is honestly kind of opaque, and it's unfortunate that if you decide to use lib syntax as the parser for your toy language, you are constrained to use a subset of valid Rust, uh, which can be really frustrating. You wind up with like a lot of type annotations that just kind of like sit there for no obvious reason. Um, so like better hooks into lib syntax so that you can kind of like roll your own parser with less dicking around would be fantastic. And one idea that I sort of didn't explore, but I think someone should, would be to abuse the Rust C plugin infrastructure. So like Basically, what you wind up doing is at the top of your program, you, you invoke like a single macro. And at that point, you have this like big hand wavy token tree thing that isn't kind of like constrained to be valid Rust. Um, yeah, I updated my slides before I got up on stage. Um, I can probably answer like a couple of quick ones and then I'm going to go and run. No? I mean, this is good for me, honestly, but. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me.